high-speed rail technology transfer. China's 36,000 kilometer and counting 750 billion US dollar high-speed rail network is the largest single infrastructure project in the world. Built in 15 years, the project under the Ministry of Railways was reminiscent of the economic plans of the first 30 years of post-revolutionary China. Massive civil construction combined with an international transfer of technology through one of the most concentrated IP purchases in history. Where did the IP come from? The world's first high-speed rail, the Tokaido Shinkansen, started in 1964 traveling from Tokyo to Osaka at 210 kilometers per hour. Its rapid and smooth acceleration and braking, stability, quiet operation, and comfort established Nippon Shario and Hitachi as leaders in high-speed rail technology. In the 1980s, the first of France's train à grande vitesse and then Germany's Intercity Express demonstrated Alstom's and Siemens' high-speed rail leadership. And North America's first high-speed rail, Amtrak's Axela Express in 2000 had rolling stock supplied by the Canadian company Bombardier. By then, the world had 15,000 kilometers of high-speed rail lines, and there was an established industry structure offering proven technologies from Asia, Europe, and North America. China had a 75,000 kilometer rail network, including both diesel and electric powered lines. And it also had the world's sole remaining steam engines in regular service. In the 1990s, the Ministry of Railways researched through hundreds of projects involving thousands of scientists and technicians, the feasibility of HSR in China. In 1998, the State Council declared that a high-speed rail line linking Beijing and Shanghai was feasible using domestic technology and launched the China Star HSR project. A prototype was tested starting in 2002, but it failed to meet signaling, braking, electric, speed, etc. specifications. The project was abandoned in 2006. In March 2003, Liu Zhejun was appointed Minister of Railways. He was determined to make full use of the latecomer advantage learning from the railway technology of developed countries. He planned to import on a nationwide scale technology to catch up with the world's best by 2020 by building four north-south lines and four east-west lines, knitting all cities with a population of more than 500,000 people in China together. Most of the cost would be capital construction, land, roadbeds, bridges, tunnels, and stations. But the key to HSR was advanced technology, the rolling stock, signaling, and electrification without which high-speed rail could not exist. The vast majority of these technologies were not protected by any Chinese patents. Cross-patenting into China at the time was the exception, not the rule. Moreover, most HSR IP rested not in patents, but in trade secrets. The process know-how of the manufacturing companies. The Chinese government wanted the two state-owned enterprises under the Ministry of Railways, China Southern Railway and China Northern Railway, CSR and CNR, to master that know-how. Technology transfer is sensitive. The World Trade Organization's trade-related aspects of intellectual property, or TRIPS, states in its general principles of technology transfer that developing countries in particular see technology transfer as part of the bargain in which they have agreed to protect intellectual property rights. The TRIPS agreement aims to achieve the transfer and dissemination of technology as part of its objectives and specifically requires developed country members to provide incentives for their companies to promote the transfer of technology. Including any such incentives, 
a major multinational company doing business in China would not give up its technology unless it got at least equal expected value in return. MNCs understood that China's government practiced quid pro quo, market access in return for technology. This was the explicit national policy throughout the 1980s and 1990s. However, when China negotiated its entry into the WTO, existing members like the U.S. raised strict conditions. One of those conditions concerned precisely that quid pro quo. China, as part of its entry deal, agreed, China shall ensure that the right of importation or investment is not conditioned on performance requirements of any kind, such as local content, offsets, the transfer of technology, export performance, or the conduct of research and development in China. Was this Chinese concession to achieve WTO against the principles of TRIPS that required that developed country members incentivize their companies to promote the transfer of technology? Perhaps, but that question is moot, because effectively quid pro quo has continued. In the early years of reform and opening, multinational corporations could enter China only through joint ventures. The Chinese joint venture partner was typically a state-owned enterprise. The state-owned enterprise would often include technology injection as part of the equity contribution of the multinational corporation. Teach the Chinese in the joint venture how to make the product. That know-how, those trade secrets, were naturally transferred to the domestic Chinese joint venture partner. Once Chinese law changed to allow foreign investors to have wholly foreign-owned enterprises, or WUFIs, in China, the WUFI became the MNC's preferred investment vehicle. They reduced leakage of trade secrets, yet quid pro quo continued. WUFIs needed government approval. The CPC wanted to upgrade China's technology. All CPC members knew that. So, regulatory benevolence has been more likely to flow to foreign direct investors engaging in more desired higher technology activities, R&D, and technology transfer into China. HSR involved technology transfer to Chinese companies. Any company in the world can purchase technology from any other company subject to agreement on price and tech transfer terms and the satisfying of appropriate import and export regulations. The Chinese purchasers and the joint venture partners were the CNR and the CSR. Their purchase of technology did not constitute on the face of it government directed quid pro quo. Yet, the CSR and the CNR high-speed rail contracts were actually negotiated by the Ministry of Railways, not by the CSR and the CNR. This facilitated coordinated negotiations with the four high-speed rail consortia leaders, Alstom, Bombardier, Hitachi, and Siemens. If the demand for technology came from commercial companies, the CNR and the CSR, that would be totally acceptable according to the deal that China had signed on WTO accession. However, the reality was that they were negotiated by the government and implemented by state-owned enterprises in violation of the spirit, if not the actual letter, of China's WTO accession undertakings. CSR and CNR signed a series of contracts. Each contract involved a purchase of train sets and other equipment coming from a different consortium led by one of Alstom's, Siemens, Kawasaki, and Bombardier. The Ministry of Railways negotiated simultaneously and separately with each of the consortium leaders, playing the bidders against each other. Some contracts involved buying and importing entire train sets, 
Others involved importing critical components of trains, coupled with Chinese production of non-critical components and assembly under foreign supplier supervision in about 30 separate factories owned by the CSR and the CNR. Contracts specified acquisition of designs, blueprints, manufacturing procedures, and training showing how to manufacture components and of how to assemble entire train sets. However, there was no training on why the sets were designed, manufactured, and assembled as they were. To help digest the technologies, the CSR and the CNR, in cooperation with researchers at neighboring universities and research institutes, figured out the reasons for the designs and procedures. How effective was this research? That's a question that foreign suppliers, averse to the loss of their technologies but keen to pursue sales in the largest market in the world, must have asked. China's ruling stock companies have filed PCTs and, and subsequent national patent applications for HSR technologies in the United States, Brazil, Russia, Japan, and the European Union. Clearly, the Chinese companies have been successful in acquiring core technologies of high-speed rail and are using them in their global strategies. Was this technology theft? Theft of trade secrets, for example, stealing documents and patent infringement, can be effectively prosecuted in national jurisdictions, including in Chinese courts. Yet no HSR technology supplier company has sued for theft of trade secrets or patent infringement. The HSR project can be seen as a massive technology for market access quid pro quo project. Was this forced technology transfer? If it was, the injured parties could have complained, but no MNC involved in it has complained and none of their home country governments have formally filed at the World Trade Organization with respect to high-speed rail technology transfer to China. Why not? Because business is business. Does the absence of complaint mean that foreign partners in Chinese foreign joint ventures feel that they are treated fairly? If a complaint of unfairness would lead to future losses of business in China, then one would not expect complaint from the multinational corporation. Quid pro quo, technology for access, is consistent with the spirit of TRIPS. Quid pro quo is inconsistent with China's strict WTO accession undertakings. Yet it continues regardless, because business is business. But there is another WTO principle which China and other countries also violate. And that principle is critical to the world vision of the World Trade Organization. The U.S. delegation to the WTO alleges that the letter of Chinese law treats domestic joint venture partners more favorably than the foreign joint venture partners regarding ownership of IP developed at a joint venture. Chinese law says the IP belongs to the Chinese joint venture partner. This suggests that China's joint venture laws violate the WTO principle of national treatment. Under WTO national treatment, domestic and foreign legal persons, the joint venture partners, should be treated equally before the law. The Chinese government, like many governments in the world, is nationalistic. It knows who are its own companies and who are the foreigners. It wants its own companies to succeed. It cares far less about the foreigners, so it bends the rules of the game to favor the home team. Yet according to WTO, all companies should be accorded national treatment. Rules of the game should be applied equally to all. There should be no home team and no foreign team in the eyes of the law. Only then can there be fair competition. Only then can the WTO vision be realized?
And if China and the other major economies flout national treatment, this calls into question the feasibility of the WTO vision. But violation of national treatment is not IP theft, and quid pro quo trading technology for market access is not IP theft. It is useful to remember that at no time in this huge technology transfer project that was high-speed rail has China been formally charged with, let alone being convicted of, committing theft of intellectual property.